Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on judicial clerkships organized by the NAI Forum in collaboration with the alumni cell of Nalsar. Uh, for today's webinar, we have two distinguished speakers in Karan Gupta and Rakshanda Deka, both of whom are Nalsar alumni. Uh, Karan graduated from Nalsar in uh, of the University of Law in 2018 as the best all round student. He has represented India at the World Championship Rounds for Jessup International Moot Court Competition as well as at Harvard University. In Nalsar, he also served as a teaching assistant for constitutional law and ran the theater club. He was a judicial clerk with Dr. Justice D.Y. Chandrachut for a period of two years from 2018 to 2020. He was awarded the UK Chevrolet Scholarship and the Oxford Widenfield Hoffman Scholarship and shall be pursuing his master's at the University of Oxford as an Oxford Widenfield Hoffman Scholar. His academic interests include, in, include law and religion, anti-discrimination law and constitutional law. Rakshanda is a 2018 alumnus of Nalsar, Hyderabad. At Nalsar, she served as an editor to the Environment Law and Practice Review as well as the Nalsar International Law Journal. She was a judicial clerk to Justice Rohingtan Fali Narirman from 2018 to 2019. Rakshanda currently works at the Chambers of Advocate Tridip Pais and regularly appears in civil and criminal matters before various district and appellate courts in New Delhi. Her academic interests include anti-discrimination, intersectionality and minority rights laws. Uh, the format of this webinar is that it will be in form of a Q&A session. These questions uh, were collected from all of you and have been condensed and structured in a manner so that it can cover all the necessary topics. Uh, such as eligibility, preparation, nature of work, road after judicial clerkships. And uh, after the initial Q&A session is done, we will have around 10 to 15 minutes for any additional questions that all the attendees might have. And you can kindly use the Q&A feature in the WebEx app uh, to ask those questions. So uh, without any further ado, let's begin. So uh, Rakshanda, uh, my first question to use, uh, you is right. that why don't we start with a brief overview of judicial clerkship uh, and, and give us a broad outline of the whole thing. Right. Uh, firstly, thank you everyone for making time to be with us for this webinar. It's great to see that like so many people are actually taking interest in clerkships, you know, as it's a lot more as compared to like maybe just a few years ago. And yeah, so to put it very briefly, a judicial clerkship is a one year engagement typically where you're attached to uh, a sitting judge of the Supreme Court or the High Court. And your job profile would vary from chamber to chamber. And like, you know, I cannot emphasize this enough that the job profile of a law clerk, whether at the Supreme Court, and I would presume at the High Court as well, is not standardized by any means. So even then, roughly what your job would include is that, you know, you would get to interact on a day-to-day -day basis with uh, the judge that you're attached to and sort of get some insight into what their work involves, what sort of matters come in uh, come to the Supreme Court, whether at the appellate stage or as original proceedings, and you know what sort of factors are important in the in the deciding of these cases. Okay, so it's a great opportunity to have also if you're sort of trying to figure out whether it is litigation that you want to pursue after, or like you know if it is something that you don't want to pursue either way, right? And uh, at the outset, it is important for me to also clarify that there's more than one channel through which you can undertake a clerkship, right? So, of course, there is the examination which is conducted by the Supreme Court. The second route is that you undertake a judicial internship at a chamber of your choice, and then that converts into a clerkship. And the third would be that you undertake a separate independent uh, recruitment process which is carried out by the chamber of your choice, the chamber that you're looking to apply to. So that would have an application process followed by a screening, followed by an interview, followed by selection, right? So for the purposes of this webinar, just to sort of uh, define the scope of this webinar, uh, I had sort of taken up the clerkship through the second route, which is that I had undertaken a judicial uh, internship. And uh, during my internship, I, had, uh, I, had, I was offered a clerkship and that's how I started doing the clerkship. Similarly, I think Karan had taken the third route, where he applied independently to Justice Chandra Chu's chamber, and then he underwent the uh, procedure laid out by that chamber, and subsequently he was selected. So to that extent, the two of us have not undertaken the examination ourselves. And while we will be trying to answer all questions that come in the course of the webinar, 
our knowledge would be limited by our experience and anything that we're able to tell you about the examination at least will be sort of second hand information thank you rakshanda uh, going to our first set of questions which are regarding eligibility to becoming a judicial clerk so my question is what are the most basic qualifications required to be appointed as a judicial clerk and can you could you distinguish between the internships and the clerkships yeah first uh, before i just begin thank you so much ankush for that warm introduction uh, i i must also add that i'm really happy to be sharing this webinar with rakshanda who's been like a really great batchmate and i think she's just a really good human all over so i'm really happy to be sharing this with her uh, quickly jumping into answering your question uh deka rakshanda pointed out briefly she said there is a distinction between a clerkship and uh an internship an internship is an informal association with the judicial chamber like an internship at any office which is typically for a shorter period of time so in some offices it's either four weeks or six weeks at dyc's office we we also had interns who stayed for six months but a clerkship is a formal association with the supreme court or the high court at which you are working generally you sign a contract and like rakshanda said it's typically a year long project right in terms of the salary we'll of course get into it but that is the basic difference between the two uh, i think there are two extremely basic qualifications that are required and we'll go into the other ones as the webinar progresses the first is that a judicial clerk is a graduate right so you either finish a 3 year law degree or a 5 year law degree anything that you do with the judicial chamber during law school is a judicial internship it's not a clerkship right the second thing is at least for the supreme court uh, because a lot of its functioning is largely in english even in terms of writing the judgment basic command over english is i think a basic qualification for a clerkship these are two things that i would flag off as the most basic qualifications mm -hmm. of course now we'll proceed to other parts of this. thank you karan uh, my next question on eligibility is for rakshanda and so the question is is there a grade or a marks cut off to be appointed through the personal application route for say like example to be in top 5 of the batch or 90% or say a higher 60 or in 7 gpa what right. else so the answer to that would definitely be a no that your grades whether you're in the top 5 of your class or not is not something that sort of like a sine qua non to your clerkship application right of course what matters is that you have a holistic application right it's important to have a well rounded sort of uh, record through law school or till the point at which you apply right as part of that it might aid your application to have above average grades right but there are other factors that weigh in as well right and that again varies from chamber to chamber so if say uh, there's a particular chamber that values a litigation internship they would not rule out your application just because say you are not in the first 5 or 10 or 15 of your class right so it's definitely not a not a mandatory sort of requirement to be at the top of your class okay. thank you thank you rakshan so uh, the next question is again with regard to eligibility and this is for karan is prior experience as a uh, uh, sorry you yeah, know it's again for rakshanda is a prior experience as a judicial intern a prerequisite qualification especially with the same chamber uh it's not a prerequisite it's definitely not a prerequisite but it helps it helps in many ways right so uh i can say this for my chamber and it's in my conversation with karan he said this is the case for his as well is that uh when you take up a judicial internship prior to your clerkship it does two things right one it lets you sort of ease into that office over a prolonged period of time so you are able to assess that office and see if it's a good fit for you right you get a sense of how the judge works you get a sense of how his current clerks work right so you get some time as opposed to say a direct application at the time of recruitment to assess the office similarly uh, the second thing is that the office gets to assess you as well yeah right so if they get to see you on your briefings if you're briefing clerks or you're briefing the judge directly that definitely has a bearing on their assessment of your application for a clerkship but okay. it's not prerequisite by any means thank you uh, next question uh, is regarding uh, current is prior experience in corporate law or a strong interest in corporate law something that disqualifies you for the post for applying for judicial clerk Uh, I think there is a misconception, Ankush, that uh, people who are judicial clerks must show an inclination only towards constitutional law. 
Uh, I don't think that's required because you know the docket of both the Supreme Court and the High Court is a bunch of matters that include company law, commercial law, SEBI matters, tax law. So I don't think having a predisposition or a CV that is geared towards corporate law is something that disqualifies you. I think the clearest example of this is uh, during my second year at the clerkship, one of my colleagues who were appointed to my office had come from a corporate law chamber in Bombay. Similarly, two people that have joined this year are also people with corporate law background. So I don't think if you have excelled in corporate law or show an interest in corporate law, it takes away from the possibility of you clerking. Like we just lost you for a while. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, now. Yeah. Like Rakshanda said, as long as you have a more holistic CV that shows the ability to dedicate to work, I think that should be enough. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Oh, uh, Karan, uh, the next question is, do you need to... I just, I think Rakshanda may want to add just something. Just think okay. that, okay. you know, in a lot of situations, depending on uh, the roster of your judge, right? right? If your judge, say, has a commercial roster primarily, it might actually work to your advantage. That you're coming from a firm background, like Karan said, that you know, I have, even I had a colleague who came from a corporate law background, and in a lot of ways, it can actually be advantageous subject to the roster of your job. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, next question, uh, Karan, is like, do you need to be enrolled as an advocate to apply for a judicial clerkship? Uh, no, you don't. Uh, both Rakshanda and I joined as judicial clerks in 2018, uh, which is before we took the bar exam. So, we signed our contracts before we even appeared for the bar exam. So you don't need to be enrolled as an advocate, but yes, you need to be a law graduate. All right. Oh, thank you. Uh, so the, uh, and moving on to the next part of the format of the questions, which is regarding preparation. So the first question uh, is for Karan. It, it, it says, what activities do law school aid in procuring a judicial clerkship, internships, or whether it is internships, publications, courses that you take, et cetera? Uh, I think this is a really important question, Ankush, because a lot of law students think that or ask whether there's any specific section in a CV that is indispensable to a judicial clerkship application. So for example, do I have to moot in law school or do I have to participate in debates? I think Rakshanda has said it perfectly when she said that what's important is that you have a holistic or an all-rounded CV. So in the leading up to a clerkship application or preparing for a clerkship application doesn't mean that you have to specifically had mooted in college or written too many papers, but as long as, like Rakshanda said, you have a holistic CV, it works better. We are, of course, in a system where, you know, having good grades is not necessarily a marker of intelligence, but having good grades definitely sets you apart from other candidates that apply. So if there's something you actively work towards in law school, grades is definitely one thing. The second is the reason why publications serve some value is because as compared to everything else on a CV, publications show your ability to contribute back to academia or actually be interested in research and bringing a fresh perspective to the clerkship. So I would highlight these two things to work on, but also clarify that the approach to an application is not thinking that there is one section that you absolutely must have. Not everyone has mooted in college or not everyone has debated in college. And that's perfectly okay. You take what is your cup of tea and excel in it. And I think that shows enough of your ability to dedicate to a clerkship. Thank you. Karin. Yeah, so the next question is for Rakshanda, which says, which is the ideal year of college or age to apply for a clerkship? Right. So uh, in terms of your uh, in terms of your eligibility sort of criteria that the Supreme Court lays down, there's an age bracket within which you can apply which is 18 to 27, right? In terms of when you can apply uh, from law school, you can only apply in your final year, right? So you're eligible to sign up for the uh, exam that the Supreme Court uh, conducts, even while you're in the final year of your college. Through all the other years, you'll be eligible for a judicial internship, right? Which can, which can very well set the ground for a subsequent judicial clerkship. Right? But in law school, you're eligible only in the fifth year. And if you're applying at a later point in your career, say after working at a firm or working elsewhere, then as long as you're within this bracket of 27, uh, yeah. you you are eligible to apply. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay. So the next question, uh, Rakshanda, is does it matter which institution you have pursued your undergrad education? Mm, 
Definitely not. Not in my experience and not, uh, I mean, subject to what Karan might have to add to this, in my experience, definitely not. Because, uh, again, like I said earlier, what matters is that you've done well at what you've done in law school, right? It is not necessary that you were the top of your class. It is not necessary that you were at multiple medals or whatever. As long as you've done multiple things and done them reasonably well, it suffices and it doesn't matter where you come from. And to sort of put that in context, in my office, we were five of us in the same term when I was clerking. And out of the five of us, only one of us was from an NLU. And I can tell you with like utmost confidence that it did not have a bearing either on our recruitment or on our experience through the clerkship. Not at all. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is actually for the uh, is uh, yeah so for the both of you uh, regarding preparation, which says what factors are crucial in the decision making process of being appointed as a judicial clerk? Are there any parameters on the basis of which applications are assessed? Rakshanda, you want to go? You want to take it first? Yeah. Sure, sure. So see again, this is very subjective, and it would vary from chamber to chamber, right? Like in some chambers, like say in mine at one point, what mattered, like, you know, what was crucial is that you come in for an internship, even if it is like, you know, even if it's as brief as two weeks, extending up to four weeks, six, whatever, right? So we preferred that people came in for an internship first, right? So that formed a part of the assessment. But especially now with the COVID pandemic and everything, scheduling uh, internships, et cetera, has become increasingly difficult. So yes, your CV is what one would go by to a large extent, right? In your CV, like Karan mentioned, uh, your grades will matter to some extent, right? Again, like we clarified earlier, not in not in a way that you know you have to top your class, but have good grades. Try to have good grades if you're still in law school. Uh, your prior internships might be taken into account. Whatever your prior work experience is, right? Depending on what the judges chamber is looking for. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, I would only add a little uh, about my office in that sense. You know, when you apply to Justice uh, Chandrachu's office, for example, there are three things that an applicant is required to send in. One is a statement of purpose of not more than 500 words, which outlines the motivations to work at a chamber. Right. Uh, then it's a writing sample, a legal writing sample on any topic, which can be up to a thousand to two thousand words. And the third is a CV. So, like Rakshanda, I said, you know. It's specific from each office to office, but generally moving into a clerkship application, either at the Supreme Court or the High Court, these are three documents that you should generally have ready because they're, they're, they're something that help in a more holistic assessment of the candidate. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Takshana, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, no, I'm good. Go uh, so, moving to the next set of questions, which is regarding the nature of the work. Uh, this is for both Rakshanda and Karen. Uh, what are the primary tasks carried out by a judicial clerk on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, if you want to go first. Right. So, uh, in terms of what the clerk's work profile is, I would split it into three broad heads, right? First would be the briefing component of what you do, whether it is oral or written, right? Okay, actually, before that, uh, just because I'm presuming there are a lot of law students as well, the way the week progresses at the Supreme Court is that matters are split between miscellaneous matters and matters that are listed for regular hearing, mm. right? So on Mondays and Fridays, usually fresh matters are being listed, right? Which are either being admitted or not admitted to the Supreme Court, right? So on those days, there'd be anything between 40 to 60 matters that are listed, right? Those are the miscellaneous days. So a bulk of the work that I did during my clerkship was reading these files and briefing the judge I was attached with on these files, right? So that forms a very, very large component of your work. And uh, I can actually come back to this in greater detail later. But this is very, very important uh, from, you know, if you're looking at it from a perspective of uh, pursuing litigation after your clerkship, because, you know, as a new lawyer who's just started litigating, you would be briefing seniors, you would be briefing your colleagues, your senior colleagues. Right? And this is a skill that's very helpful for that. Uh, it keeps you on your toes because you're sort of directly answerable to the judge. And while it can be a little daunting at first, right? it can be somewhat intimidating. But in the long run, it lets you sort of overcome mistakes that you make, uh, say, in your initial weeks. 
and you know that sort of leads to a process where you're confident about how you're going about doing something. Yeah? That's one part. The second part is uh, assistance that you can offer in terms of writing and uh, research for uh, judgments, right? So when the judge is writing a judgment, you would essentially be carrying out research assignments, which uh, support the judge in writing those judgments, right? So this could range from whether it is case law based research, whether it's statute based research, sometimes you'd be doing some archival research. Again, I'm sure this will vary from office to office, but forms a very crucial part of the clerkship experience. And the third part uh, for me would be all the other sort of academic and ex officio obligations that the judge has, whether it is uh, like, you know, writing for publications or speeches or uh, anything else, he'd be writing a forward for a book, you would have to do some research and like, you know, provide material for that. Right? So these would be three broad components of what you do. And a fourth component, which I think in some offices is very, very uh, pronounced, it wasn't as much in my office, is your presence in court, right? So if you're doing oral briefings, that's a time consuming exercise that sort of makes a, like, you know, you have to, because you have to balance your time between court and office, right? The fourth component in a lot of offices would be your presence in court, where you sort of see court proceedings, take notes, and things like that. Right? But that would largely be the scheme of it as I see. Yeah, I would I would say uh, sim a little similar to uh, what Rakshanda said. I'll personalize it a little more towards the office and also keep it broad in general. I think there are four like really distinct components. Uh, like Rakshanda said, the first is working on files which for most clerkships takes a bulk of the work you do at the office, right? So in some offices, like the one that Rakshanda worked at, you orally brief the judge on every file. In some offices, like the one I worked at, you don't orally brief the judge unless he specifically wants a matter to be orally briefed. Uh, the second is to work on speeches, academic work, forwards, research work. This takes the form of putting together research and giving it to the judge with whom you're working so that they can structure their work accordingly. The third is judgment work, which varies very much from office to office, but broadly speaking, it involves specific points of research that the judge gives you that you can hand back to the judge for them to use. The fourth that was also a little more specific to my office was uh, dedicating time to the internship program. So. In some offices, the interaction between the intern and the judge is high, and in some offices, it's medium. In my office, it was medium, but at the same time, because as clerks, we interact a lot with the interns, it was also part of our job profile to help them learn how to brief files, to keep them updated on court proceedings, to actually push them to go to court. So shaping the internship program is also something that we personally dedicated time to. So yeah, uh -huh. it's very similar to what Rakshanda said, but this is broadly speaking what the work profile of a judicial firm. Thank you, thank you, Karan. Uh, the next question is, uh, Karan, what does an average day of a clerk look like in terms of timing and like your schedule? I mean, I'm, I'm sure Rakshanda and I will uh, preface every answer by saying it's subjective to chambers, but we're trying to put in as much information as we can. I mean, some offices, offer a Sunday off. Other offices like mine worked seven days a week, so we didn't have a single day off. Now, in terms of how a working day is Monday to Friday, I can uh, divide my answer into two parts. One is I can tell you about how my office did it and how generally you see it in other clerkships as well, right? So in my office, generally, we did spend a good amount of time in court listening to matters and taking down extensive notes. So on days, I would spend maybe 10.30 to 2 o'clock in court. Right, on the days when there were actually arguments, I would come back, I would uh, supervise the files and supervise the interns till about say 7.38. And if there's any other work, I would wrap up by 10.30. So any normal working day looked at around 10 o'clock to 10.30. Some offices like say the ones Rakshanda worked at started really early because they had oral briefings. So Rakshanda started at 6.30 and I'm sure she'll tell you more about that. Saturday and Sunday is a time when most judges spend time in the chamber working on judgments or files or other matters. So we also stay back the entire day in the chamber with them and help them out. So broadly speaking, uh, while some offices have an emphasis on going to court and attending court, some offices don't necessarily have that emphasis. But it only means that there's enough work to go around that focuses on the different components of the four things that a clerk does. So it's not to say that you have to go to court or do not have to go to court. 
it always boils down to what your judge thinks best enables them to do their work better. Thank you, Karan. Jakshender, do you have anything to add to this? No, I, I think broadly it is what Karan has covered. And it is correct that some offices start a little later in the day because we did a round of briefings before our judge left for court. So we'd start a little early, say 7.15ish is when we'd start briefing on most days. But then again, it was dependent on work. We could start later depending on work. But the average uh, work timing in my office was probably, say, 7 in the morning to, I'd say, 9.30, 10 at least on a good day. And depending on work, we would shift it out. Yeah. I, I would only add to that because I forgot to say, and like Rakshanda said, it's on good days. So, I mean, one of the things that you have to be prepared for in a clerkship is there are days that are not so good. So when regular days can go up to 10 o'clock, there have been days where I'm sure both Rakshanda and I, we've just stayed till maybe sunrises or all night in the office and come back at regular time and got started. So a clerkship is extremely strenuous, but of course, it's also very rewarding. Thank you, Karan. Thank you, Rakshanda. Uh, the next question is uh, to Rakshanda. It asks, what are the contract terms, uh, uh, one year bar from SC lifetime before your judge, and what is that clerkship term, and any are there any possibilities of an extension? Right. So, like I said earlier, typically you sign a one year contract. Right. This is extendable. In Karan's case, he did he did extend it, which he can tell you about. Uh, but in terms of your contract terms. It's a one year contract. A premature discharge is something that is possible. Right? It can happen from the registry's end, which is from your officer's end. You can do it from your end. You would have to give a notice period. And uh, of the more important terms is that there is a one year bar on a judicial clerk who's on the Supreme Court role from practicing before the Supreme Court. Right? Mm -hmm. So when you end your uh, clerkship, one year immediately after that, you cannot practice before the Supreme Court. And there is a bar in perpetuity uh, to appearing before the concerned judge, uh, before the judge to whom you were attached. So, for example, I can never appear before Justice Nariman. Right? So, those are the bars. Uh, the other very important part of the contract, which you kind of only figure once you get on the job, which is not otherwise talked about very much, is your confidentiality obligations. Right? You are bound by the contract to maintain sort of utmost secrecy in terms of the work that you do. That's the nature of your job you're, when you're working with a judge at the Supreme Court. Right? So you will have to be very, very mindful of not mentioning things about your work or any information that comes to you by virtue of being a judicial clerk on any public platform anywhere else. Right? In fact, the contract actually says that the contract is subject to provisions of the penal code as well as the official secrets act. Right? So it's a fairly high standard, and that's something that you would have to obey. All right. Uh, moving on. Oh, one little this. thing. Sorry, can I just yeah. add? The yeah. other thing is that uh, you cannot simultaneously be engaged with any other job. Like goes without saying during the clerkship, yeah. and uh, you cannot appear like you can't sort of one day be like I'll appear for my friend and quickly come. You can't appear before a court. You can't appear before a court during your clerkship. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, the next question, Karen, is that how is the clerk's time split between the courtroom and the chamber? I think I partly answered this in the previous yeah. one, but um, it depends on where the emphasis in a chamber is. So, for example, if your clerkship is largely around briefing files for admission days, then there is no real requirement to be in court unless the judge specifically asks you. Uh, from my experience, there were two ways in which we did it. When there was a big matter or a sensitive matter, we clerks always made it a point to be in court and take down notes. Or if there was a specific matter which uh, my boss asked me to be there in court for, I would do that. I mean, in my office, we definitely spent a lot more time in court. But again, I think it's a fair balance. Uh, I don't think uh, judges would ask their clerks to not go to court because it's inherently a part and parcel of clerking to actually get the opportunity to witness some of the greatest legal minds argue in the court. So if a judicial clerk specifically asks the judge, can they go to court, they wouldn't say no. But it's always subject to getting the work done on time. So it, okay. whilst it varies from office to office, like I said, it comes down to where the emphasis is on in terms of work culture in the office. Well, thank you. Uh, I just like to tell all the attendees to kindly ask the questions in the Q&A feature instead of the chat. 
uh, that will make it a lot easier to ask it at the end. Okay. So uh, moving on to the next set of questions, which is the road after judicial clerkships. Uh, so first question, Rakshanda, is uh, could you uh, like does a clerkship help a prospective litigation career? And if it does, how does it help? Is it worth investing one or two years? Right. I think I would say in my experience, it does definitely sort of help a career in litigation, not just from the perspective of you being recruited by a law chamber, right? I think if you work with a judge and worked closely on matters on a day-to-day -day basis, that definitely carries value from the point of view of recruitment, right? But it's also, I think, about the skills you carry over from your clerkship to your practice, right? So when you're reading files, briefing your judge, you get a good sense of, say, how do you place material before a court even as an advocate? You see what sort of supporting documents are prioritized in what manner across subject matter. Right? And that's valuable experience to carry forward to a career in litigation. So yes, I've personally found it very, very helpful when I've switched on to litigation. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, so the next I just, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I can just add that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I agree with Rakshanda. I haven't gone into litigation yet. I hope to litigate after I come back from my master's. but. Uh, I think there are three things that I've taken away from my clerkship that I think really help in litigation. Uh, one is just in terms of having comfort in reading an entire file because of the number of files that you read or brief during a clerkship, you start picking the nuances of how to get a more holistic idea of the entire matter. So whilst you're focusing on the nuances, you also start getting the broader picture legal points that are involved in a matter. Uh, the second thing I think, or the way in which I think it helps is you have a chance to watch senior counsels as well as junior counsels argue at the highest court mm -hmm. or in, in a high court. And what you notice is when a file can have maybe 10 different points, the specific logic and reasoning that goes into picking specific legal points and the method of arguing them is something that you watch at the highest level. So that really helps. And the third thing that I've personally taken away from my clerkship is uh, having clerked for two years, I've noticed that I've been able to work on my own language in terms of now when I actually write something in terms of an academic paper or otherwise, my language is a lot stronger. It's a lot more concise because you're just, you're so focused on reading judgments, on reading research, on reading some great articles, listening to the best arguments. So it definitely fine tunes the way you put arguments. Uh, and uh, again, in addition to that, one sort of practical advantage that I sort of felt when I made the switch was that uh, because, especially if your judge has a diverse roster, right? The mm. chamber I worked in had a fairly diverse roster. So it lets you sort of get a sense of what sort of matters interest you. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, I may have briefed for a tax law matter, but you know, over my briefings, if it's a subject area I do not enjoy, yeah. then I know how it will affect my choices when I litigate later, yeah. right? Just as an example, yeah. right? So if you have, you have uh, the sort of exposure to a wide range of matter and you get to sort of filter out your own interests, which is very, very helpful. Uh, thank you, Rakshandra. Thank you, Karan. So uh, the next question uh, is for Karan is, does a clerkship increase the chances of sec securing admissions into prestigious universities for a master's? Is there any relevance to it if you do not wish to study further? I think there's a common misconception, Ankush, that if you've uh, done a clerkship at the High Court or the Supreme Court, or you have a recommendation letter from a judge, it means guaranteed admission. Uh, I can tell you that's not the case, right? Now, I can't deny or downplay that having a recommendation letter from a reputed source, like one of a judge, is important. But having been through the process through the last two years, I've also come to understand that with a master's application, it's a real holistic application. So there are so many components. You need to have an extremely focused statement of purpose. You need to demonstrate skills and dedication in your CV and then have an add-on with recommendation letters. So do recommendation letters help from a clerkship? They do. Do they guarantee admission into prestigious universities? They do not, right? Uh, what I want to add here is that from my personal experience, because I think a clerkship involves such a broad range of work and also hard work at a lot of times. 
I think personally, it makes sense to have a motivation that surpasses a recommendation letter. Of course, everyone has their own reason for clerking or doing any job for that matter. And I think that's perfectly okay. But for me, when I came into the job or when I took a clerkship, it was motivated by the fact that I had done specific work in the field. I had worked on constitutional law, served as a constitutional law TA. I had written a couple of papers on judicial discretion. And because I wanted to pursue my master's in that specific field, I thought that a clerkship is relevant. So quickly summarizing, it does help, but it's not indispensable or something that guarantees you an admission. And I think generally speaking, if you want to justify a clerkship in its totality, you may want to look beyond the recommend recommendation letter as the sole reason for clerk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question uh, for Dakshanda is, is a judicial clerkship helpful for a career in academia? Mm, see, that's not something that I can, I have first-hand experience with to tell you, because mm. that's not the switch I made. But uh, I think I would relate it back to Karan's response to whether it helps you with a master's, right? Because it is uh, quite unlikely, like I don't know of a case where someone's done a clerkship out of law school or a few years out of law school. And you know, directly sort of dived into academia, right? You would mm -hmm. ordinarily pursue your higher studies and then come back. So at the least, it is as helpful uh, for academia as I would presume it is for a master's degree, right? So I think it's the logical extension after that. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's a direct option that you dive into. I mean, that's my understanding. But again, this is limited by my. Karen, do you have anything? No, I would agree with Rakshanda. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the next question, uh, Karan, is, uh, the question is, does a clerkship reduce the chances of pursuing a specialization or a master's in a corporate law, in a corporate law course? Uh, yeah, I, I would relate the, this back to one of our initial answers that there's an under, there's a presumption that what you do at a clerkship is only constitutional law. I mean, there are a lot of matters that you do, including uh, MACT matters, which is motor accident claims tribunal or insurance calculations or tax matters or SEBI matters. So the point is, because you've clerked, it doesn't reduce your chance of doing a specialization in corporate law or commercial law. So for example, now though I'm not doing a specialization in that, the reason I can say that is because I've had immediate colleagues or I've had friends who have also applied after the clerkship for a specialization in commercial law or insurance law, right? Yeah, yeah. And it always comes down to how best you're able to justify the decisions in law school as well as in your work experience. So a lot of it is about constructing a more coherent narrative about why all the things that you've done in the past logically lead you to the masters which you want to do. So yeah. it's a lot more about packaging and not about one of those, you only have to do human rights or constitutional law to get a certain masters. So if you've done a clerkship, I don't think it either reduces or increases your chance specifically for commercial law, because a master's application as a whole is just a different ball game altogether. Um, um, also, I think uh, yeah. from like, you know, like looking at it practically, it is very hard for you to decide how your clerkship will go in terms of subject matter, yeah. right? Because your judge's roster could change at any point in time. Yeah. You will yeah. have to do whatever that judge is required to look at, right? So it makes sense to go in with uh, an open mind to that extent. Like you could get lucky, like I did in a way that my judge had a diverse roster, but I had great colleagues and all of us had somewhat varied interests, right? So among ourselves, we would try to sort of read files that are within our interest area and read those files. But that's an internal adjustment question, right? Which, and you may not have the luxury of that sort of an option at all points in time. So when you yeah. go in, you should go in knowing that, you know, you, might, you may not necessarily be able to align it with your higher studies plan. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, moving on to some of the miscellaneous questions that we had relating to some of the uh, topics. Yeah, yeah, the mm -hmm. first question is for Rakshanda. It said, what is the procedure of salaries? As in every clerk, is every clerk supposed to get the salary? Or is on is it on the discretion of the judge? And do you think salary has a bearing on the decision to undertake a clerkship? Right. So, uh, I think as things stand now, there are four clerks per chamber. Who are on uh, who are on the Supreme Court roll, and those uh, those clerks are salaried. The salary just now stands at uh, sixty five thousand rupees, if I'm not mistaken. But in the recent past, like over the last three years, the salary has been revised 
uh, multiple times, right? Now, over and above these four slots, it is, of course, the judge's discretion to hire more clerk. And their administration is something that is, again, on the judge's discretion. That's not something right. that, you know, the, that we can talk about. But there are four slots per chamber, as far as we know, which are salaried. In terms of whether it has a bearing on your decision to pursue a judicial clerkship, I think at a point it did, right? But now, even now, depending on what your personal obligations in life are, what your financial constraints are, and what your financial obligations are, it obviously might have a bearing as does any other job. But I think it's more competitive now than it has ever been before in terms of, like, you know, the salary as compared to, like, say, the litigation chambers or anything else. And uh, like Karan mentioned a while ago, that earlier it was seen as a stepping stone to higher studies, like, you know, whether, whether at an Oxbridge or at an Ivy League or whatever, you know. People viewed a clerkship as, like, like you know, as a ticket to a good college for, for your higher studies, right? So even when, say, your salary was not as competitive as it is now, right, you may have still undertaken it for, quote, unquote, CV value. Yeah. But I think that has significantly changed now because it's not as much, I won't say it is not a constraint because mm. it would depend on our uh, individual obligations, but it is much lesser a constraint than it used to be, right? And in that sense, I think how people view clerkship should also widen and has in fact widened. Right? Yeah. That it's not just about your master's degree, there's a lot more, it's like a much wider sort of skill set that you can build on this. Maybe you have something to add? Yeah, the only thing I would add to what Rakshanda said is, you know, the, to the best of my knowledge, uh, high courts range between, say, 30,000 to 50, 55,000. The Supreme Court currently is at 65,000. And to a question whether 65,000 is adequate to survive in Delhi in terms of having a mix between your professional and personal life, I think it personally is. I didn't have to take any money from home. And 65,000 was adequate for me to pay all my bills in Delhi and even have a small saving. So it's, it's really enough to suffice in Delhi. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank and you in fact, that. even before it was 65K, mm. like I was, the time when I was working, I think it was, it was 50, right? And even that was like, also because like, I did not have any obligations apart from myself when I was doing the clerkship. Mm. I managed to meet all my expenses quite comfortably. Mm -hmm. And also had like a very minimal sort of a saving component. But yeah, it does suffice usually. With 65, I would think it's more than comfortable. Very, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Arshanda. Thank you, Karan. Uh, the next question uh, for Karan is, what are the do's and don'ts of a clerkship in terms of confidentiality, integrity, and all, and other yeah. related? Uh, I'll start with the do's. Right. Uh, I think one of the more important do's in a clerkship is to be extremely proactive. Right. Uh, the idea in a clerkship is about the, the value you bring to the clerkship is something that's dependent on you. So, for example, one of the things we would do in our chambers is to be extremely aware of new academ academic literature that is being produced all across the world or some new judgment that's been handed down by a high court or a Supreme Court elsewhere across national frontiers. Right? So being proactive in terms of really understanding new literature out there and actively bringing it to the attention of the judge with whom you're working. Right? The second do is developing a really good work ethic. I think one of the things with being associated with the institution is that you must have really good work ethic. Right? It's a great opportunity to be working with a judge and no one denies that. So, you know, in terms of submitting work on time or volunteering to take on more work. Of course, it comes down to individual work characteristics, but it's great to have a certain dedication and drive towards the clerkship because also of the prestige it holds and the kind of learning it offers. Yeah. Um, in don'ts, I think the more important don'ts are uh, to not speak about the work that you do in a clerkship. Like Rakshanda said, confidentiality is an absolute must. Over and above the fact that it's a contractual term, I also think it's ethic that's associated with the office. You know, in terms of discussions you may have with colleagues or the judge with whom you're working, uh, it's an absolute necessity that you don't speak to friends or peers or colleagues or ever after the clerkship about it. The second don't would be, even though this is not a formal requirement, it's generally presumed that you don't publish or write on the things on which you've worked 
during your clerkship, right? So academic literature in terms of what you do after the clerkship, again, it's not a requirement, but it's presumed to be something that's a good thing to do with an office. Uh, the third is, I mean, we hear this a lot, though, it would be that you generally, uh, only when you, you know when you're working in the office, if you're walking to the court and around, there's generally a lot of press, there's a lot of people that know you're associated with the judge's chamber. It's good to understand that your work during the clerkship is under the limelight. It's not something that you should not use the clerkship as a manner specifically to open doors or specifically to reach certain places. So I think it's just ethic that's associated with the office that makes you a little more wary with how you deal with the outside world when you are. Thank you, Karan. Uh, the next question is, Karan, is what is the difference between a high court and a Supreme Court clerkship? Uh, here I would say that, uh, again, I only have secondhand knowledge because uh, I've never worked at the High Court, but I've spoken to a couple of friends who worked at the High Court for this session. So what I can say is uh, the first difference, at least from what I've heard, is in that many High Courts, uh, clerks work at the court. Right Now, in the Supreme Court, all judicial clerks generally work in the chamber, which is uh, associated with the residence of the judge. Right, So you stay at an office that is in their residence. And in most high courts, you actually work in the court at all times. So your interaction with the court, your interaction with the registry, with the masters in the court, with other judges in the court is much higher as compared to a Supreme Court clerkship. Uh, the second difference, I think, is in terms of the kind of research you do. When you're researching at the Supreme Court level, finding precedent is you're generally also looking at Supreme Court precedent. Right. At the high court, it's mixed because if you have a Supreme Court precedent, then it's binding on every high court, yeah. right? And if you have precedent from that high court, it has persuasive value unless it's of a co-equal bench or a higher bench. So yeah. the kind of research you do on judgments is slightly different for high court as the one that you do in Supreme Court. But this is what I would outline as the broad two differences that happen between the two clerkships. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Rakshanda, the next question is regarding what what is uh, regarding the examination that happens for judicial clerkship and as to how the examination is conducted and the nature of the right. So ordinarily the Supreme Court website gives you all the details of you know how the examination is conducted. And uh, I've not written it myself, but like with some help from my colleague who had come in through the examination. I can like sort of outline how it works, right? So it's a two-step assessment project, uh, sorry, process uh, ordinarily. It has uh, a written test component and uh, it has an interview component, right? So it's a 150 mark written test, right? Out of that 150 marks, 100 marks is law-based. So that would be your constitutional law, your criminal procedure, your civil procedure, evidence, IPC, right? that would form the bulk of your law question. In terms of the nature of questions that are asked in the law section, there are a lot of, so there may not, because this is entirely MCQ by the way. So oh. there won't be uh, like a lot of application based questions. There might be a lot of direct factual questions. So it will be helpful to remember important provisions. Right? In terms of material that you can use for this section, Again, uh, based on recommendations that I've had from people who have written this exam, the uh, material that's available for uh, the preliminary judicial services exam is something that you can rely on for this section. Okay? Because uh, preparatory material for a judicial clerkship exam is not something that's like you know dedicatedly available. Right? For the other 50 marks, uh, that is your general knowledge and uh, basic English. English comprehension, etc. Okay, so you, the same prep that you do for your CLAT, okay. okay, the prep for this section would be similar to that. So this is 150 marks, right? Now your interview is a 30 mark uh, sort of segment, right? In which there's a panel of sitting uh, judges of the court, right? In the Supreme Court, these are all Supreme Court judges. They would proceed on the basis of information that you've disclosed in your application form. And they would have copies of your CV, right? So they, their questions would pertain to that. It would be a mix of questions like related to law, certainly, and also you know stuff about like your convenience of being in Delhi. Why is it that you want to do a clerkship? What do you intend to do after? 
things like that right so that, that's your uh, interview component and uh, it is hard and like there's something that i think we had gotten when we were sort of collecting questions a uh, few days back uh, it is hard to preempt which judge will be allotted to you if you are coming through the examination well, right so there's a merit list that's drawn out of 30 marks in the interview i think 15 is the basic qualifying mark right that be a rank list that will be your final list that comes out of everyone who makes it i think thrice the number of uh, seats is what is, is what they interview so if say there were there were to be 10 seats they'd interview 30 people okay. right and uh, it's hard to guess who you would be allotted to right it's at the discretion okay. of the registry it's at the discretion of the chamber that the registry wants to allot you to so that's not something that you know i have great insight into but if anyone attending this webinar is keen on like more information as to how this process goes, I'm sure uh, both Karan and I might be able to link you to people you know who uh, undertaken the exam themselves. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rakshanda. Uh, the next set of questions are these uh, basically yes or no questions that are coming from the people who are sending questions. So uh, the first question is: Can a foreign national be a judicial clerk in an Indian court? No. You, can take it. <laughs> you have to be an Indian national to take up a class. All right. Yeah. All right. So, uh, next question, Karan. Uh, if I'm from a non NADU, does it mean that I will not be selected? That you will, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? If I'm from a non NLU background, does it mean that I will not be selected for the post of the judicial class? I think Rakshanda has answered that absolutely perfectly, and I would not add to that. It All doesn't right. mean that you're not going to get a clerkship. Yeah. Yeah, uh, is there an age bar? I think this question also got answered in terms of 18 to 27. 18 to 27, right. Yeah. Uh, is prior experience as an advocate disqualifying? No. It's actually advantages in some situations. Yeah. Right? Right. Especially, yeah. especially in chambers that have oral briefing. Yeah. Right? Right. Some prior experience with litigation might actually help you. Litigation, yeah. I'm sorry, litigation or even at a firm or whatever. Yeah. Some work ex yeah. actually helps. Yeah. yeah, sorry, Ankush, I would just clarify there. You know, initially I'd said that uh, having commercial law or corporate law interest does not disqualify you. Yeah. The only rider I would add is it does not mean that having litigation experience is not a plus. Right? Because right. at the end of the day, it is a chamber that's dealing in litigation. So it, it, it is a plus. Right. And the final question is, can it the, the judicial clerkship be for two years, which I think you had answered by saying you can ask for an extension. Yes, uh, I don't. I, I think it's important to say that extensions are not automatic and based on the will of the clerk. It's based on a conversation with the judge, and if the judge has liked your work over the last year, then it's up to them to extend the clerkship. I also know a clerk who's clerked for three years at the Supreme Court. I don't All know right. anyone who's done it more than three years, but yes, clerking for more than one year is possible. All right. Uh, I think that's the end of the first part of the webinar in terms of answering the questions that we had asked for before. Uh, now we'll move on to some of the questions that have been asked in the q and as well as the chat. So, uh, yeah, this is one question that's been asked by Akash. He asked, uh, in case someone is not able to secure judicial clerkship at the Supreme Court, but manages to get it in any high court, does it help in getting any judicial clerkship after that at the Supreme Court? So initially, he got, someone got it at the high court and then did that and will that help him to get it at the Supreme Court later on? I think uh, it, it's before you know. I answer that question directly. I also think it's really important to point out that uh, I I don't think I think people should view a Supreme Court clerkship and a High Court clerkship to some degree at the same level. The High Courts in the country have given excellent decisions to say the least. You know, so it does not mean that you only have to work at the Supreme Court. Uh, having said that. When you're applying for a Supreme Court clerkship, if you do have judicial internships or you have clerked at a high court before, then it's a definite plus. Does it mean that you're definitely going to get a Supreme Court clerkship? No, because it's relative to the people that have applied in your year, but it's a definite plus to show that you already have that prior experience coming in. All right. Rakshanda, do you have anything to add? No, no, I would agree with Karan. All right. Uh, There is one question regarding, uh, I don't know who asked it, which asks that 
but how do you apply for say judicial internships and is it only possible if you have say personal contact and is there a formal process of doing that uh no i wouldn't say that you necessarily need a personal contact to pursue for judicial internship what you definitely need is uh, you need to know where to send your application right and it yeah. usually helps to send your application directly to the ps of the judge or to anyone in that chamber because right. i think sometimes what happens is that the supreme court website lists certain email id uh, which right. not all chambers check regularly okay right? so it makes sense to uh, procure an email id for the office that you are interested in send in an application and you can follow up of course you can follow, like it's important to follow up actually because the bulk of applications that they that every office receives is quite significant so it would help for you to follow up with uh, you do not necessarily need a personal contact on current we have anything to add yeah i would say there are uh, two additional things you can do i mean i would agree that there is definitely uh, there's definitely an information asymmetry in terms of sourcing the email ids out there so one way to go about that is to actively reach people who have either clerked or interned at an office before and ask them for the email id you can even do this on linkedin i know a lot of students who have done it on linkedin the second option is if you are absolutely not able to source the email id to which you have to apply you can send a hard copy of your application to the registry right yeah. and specify in the application that you want this application to be forwarded to a specific office so at yeah. dic chambers we've received internship applications from the registry and what it has is it has the entire application and the the candidate has specified that i want this application to go to this office so the registry takes care of it and sends it directly to the residents all right uh the next question is regarding uh, with, so currently due to the pandemic uh, we can't be doing physical internships so are judicial internships being offered in a virtual manner at the offices that you guys have worked on you know of do they offer uh so the thing is i like i mean as a matter of fact i do not know about all offices but the but the nature of what you do at a judicial internship is so uh file heavy you know in the okay. sense that it's so document based that there might actually there might be a logistical difficulty in making those papers available to you over email right okay. so that might have led uh, to a reduction in the number of internships that are being offered right but i think it would be worth it to communicate with the concerned office and ask them if their internship program is such that it can be uh, sort of uh, done in an online format like don't not apply because you think it might be online or you might not get it all right sir we are going to no i am good with that uh there was a question regarding does a judicial clerkship uh, help in the judicial in the preparation for a judicial exam as in the lower judicial or the higher judicial exam you want to take that car i'm sorry could you just repeat that the voice broke a little Uh, as in, in the does the judicial clerkship, uh, as in, if you have done the judicial clerkship, does that help you be a better candidate for, say, a judicial, lower judiciary exam or the higher judiciary exam? Is there a link? To be very honest, I know extremely little about the judicial services exam, so I would not want to offer advice where I'm not confident. All right. All right. Uh, I don't think so. There are in. I mean, there are a lot of questions, but that they've been answered mostly. during the course. yes one question that i see i think okay. i can just ask because i think it's actually a um, a question that's been typed out twice which is uh, after hearing us it does seem like there's no work life balance at uh, during a clerkship so i think this is really personal it depends on how you manage it but coming into a clerkship i definitely think you have to be mentally prepared for there to be an extremely high level of work that work will always take precedence over any other activity that you may want to do so that balance is it possible i think i personally was able to draw a bit of a balance it was restricted yes but i had come in ready to take on the kind of work that a clerkship involved so i think that that mindset is really important rakshanda um no no i don't have anything to add to this because like i mean i think it's mostly common what we will have to say but yes your work life balance might take a hit depending on the workload of your chamber Right. but i mm -hmm. think you know when you view it like sort of 
in the end, when you look back, uh, I think for most of us, it's a worthy bargain because the learning your learning curve is really really steep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't we... want to romanticize the lack of a work life balance. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, it 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 is quite rewarding. Uh, I think this will take. Uh, if I can find it, how does a judicial clerkship help for an interdisciplinary academic career? Uh, I'm not too sure. Uh, I mean, it's it's a little difficult for us to comment because we've not entered yeah. academia, you know. But uh, there's actually one question, Ankush, that I think uh, might be worth answering, which is yeah, yeah. when is it a good time to send a personal application to the office? Now, uh, most offices start their assessment sometime in March. And assessment right. periods range between March to June. So, you know, I heard a decision on my clerkship in May, and it ranges from office to office. But I think it's good to make sure you have a ready application by at least Jan and not delay it because some offices finish their process really early and some late. So, looking to apply in May and June is generally not a good idea because the process is already underway. All right. I think broadly all offices, like regardless of where you want to apply, I think by January, February, you should start thinking about it and inquiring. Yeah. I think all most right. application processes happen in like March, April. March, April is very, very crucial. Right? But right. definitely don't wait until April to call for the first time. All right. uh, think... There's a question, sorry, if I may pick. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, someone has asked, how can we get a clerkship on a permanent basis? Uh, that it is not a standing position. Right. It is not an indefinite, it's a contract based short term sort of assignment. Right. So you cannot get a permanent uh, position. You can get an extension of maybe two years, three years. But like, I think that would about be about it ordinarily. All right. Uh, I think that would be all. I think there's a lot of repetitive questions. And I think you've answered me. Unless uh, you guys have found any other question which you want to answer. Yeah, this is something I hadn't addressed when I spoke of it. Uh, is the age gap of 27 applicable only for the first mode of recruitment, that is examination conducted by BSC, or to all three modes? Uh, mm -hmm. It is definitely applicable uh, for the examination. And I think if you want to be one of the clerks who are enrolled with the Supreme Court registry, it would be safe to be within that limit. Okay. okay. But at their discretion, I mean, there might be adjustments that an office makes. So if you're falling outside the 27 bracket, I would say inquire. Okay. Uh, I think we can end with that question. Uh, unless you have any. Yeah, I think, I think we've covered most questions. At least yeah. the one should answer, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, I would at least, uh, you know, before concluding from my side, what I would add is, uh, Ankush, one mm -hmm. of the things that have definitely stood out in the past two years is that um, students do find it a little hard to contact these offices, right? Uh, so at least from a, I, I can't speak about the high courts because I've not had interaction with them, but I have had interaction with the Supreme Court level. And to the students that are watching the webinar or who will watch the webinar, I think, uh, Feel free to ever reach out, uh, Rakshanda, if she's okay with that as well. And we can of always course. source the email IDs to which you can apply. I mean, there should be no harm in reaching out and actively asking for assistance, given that there is definitely an information asymmetry. Uh, just hold on. Uh, just give me one moment. Uh, so Someone's, uh, I've privately received a question which says, how much does the CV of a person matter? Mine isn't a great CV. I have only one article, uh, one publication, couple of internships and three moves. Does that lower my chance of backing a judicial, uh, of bagging a judicial clerkship? Like we said in the course of the webinar, no, it does not. Please put in your application. It, uh, you, won't, you wouldn't know what the specific considerations of an office are. It does help help to have a holistic CV, like we said. But I mean, I did not have three moods when I applied. So you should definitely. Do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, then I think one question that I found it says if one one has applied for masters and clerkship simultaneously and get selected for masters after one has accepted clerkship, can one revoke the clerkship acceptance? See, it's hard for us to tell you that. You can <laughs> 
Uh, I mean, yeah, it's it, definitely not proper, right? To not, accept I, something I and then say, no, it's definitely not a proper way to do it. And you don't want to be stepping into the legal field doing something like that. Yeah. yeah. And especially in terms of it being a contract. So once you formally accepted it, yeah. it's a bit difficult. Yeah. Uh, right. uh, I, think, I, mean, I, think, I think we've covered it. If anyone has any questions, or we can see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Mm. Go ahead, Ankush. Yeah, yeah. So thank you, Karan. Thank you, Rakshanda, for doing this extremely informative and comprehensive webinar. Uh, thank you for working on the questions, taking so much of time from it. From you, uh, thank you for taking up so much time. And uh, thank you, uh, everyone who attended the webinar and you know, like and send us the questions. Uh, just to add here is that uh, this uh, please uh, you can follow the Facebook page of Naya Forum and the alumni cell and the Twitter handle for the Naya Forum. The NAI forum also has a blog that we run, which we are on which we post consistently articles related to the legal profession and the judiciary, and to which you can contribute as well. So please do that as well, uh, and make sure that you at least read the. We try. We are trying to put it up as as frequently as possible. Uh, so thank yeah, you, Raksha. Thank yeah, you. has also hosted some really great panelists before, so you should check out their YouTube channel and their articles. I mean, it's definitely a treasure trove of. Legal information out there. Yeah, so the thank you so much, Ankush. Thank you so much, uh, Rakshanda. It's been really yeah. great to join you. If there's anything I would say to the students watching, please never hesitate to reach out for help. Uh, with the legal world, there's always something that we should do to give back, and uh, I'm always happy to help. Yeah, you should feel free to reach out to us whether on LinkedIn or email. I think you can email Naya for our contact details. Yeah. Uh, 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 for privately. And, the videos that Karan talked about are there on the NALSA YouTube channel yes. uh, under the playlist of Nyaya and Nyaya Forum. Yes. So you can check out all our earlier webinars and other lectures that we have done in the past. Uh, okay, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Rakshanda. Thank, thank you, you, Karan. Thank Thanks you everyone, for attending Thanks. this session. Yeah. Thank you, Karan. Bye.